Good morning. For the rest of the course, the last two sessions, we're going to see how philosophy compares and contrasts to physics in regard to the question of induction. We're going to identify the inductive similarities between the two subjects and also the differences uh, which affect the form of their induction in certain crucial ways. The differences, although we're going to start on some today, are going to be mainly covered in Lecture 5. So let us start with some obvious and important contrast between the two subjects. Physics, as you know, is a science which studies the nature and laws of matter. And if it makes you feel better, throw in and energy. <coughs> But what is philosophy? Here is my definition. I don't know if I've ever given this in a course before. But maybe you have, you'll have heard it. Philosophy is the science which defines the proper relationship between a volitional consciousness and reality. Is that new to any of you? Nobody. OK. Philosophy is the science which defines the proper relationship between a volitional consciousness and reality. By a proper relationship here, I mean a consciousness in contact with reality and guided by it in all its choices. Now this definition implies that there's a branch of philosophy which does not uh, talk about the proper relationship, but simply tells us that consciousness and reality exist. And that, of course, is metaphysics. This one branch is not concerned with proper relationships, but merely with the existence of the two. And this is obviously the precondition of the other branches. But in all its other branches, what philosophy does is tell us the proper relation of our conscious choices to reality. It tells us how to achieve full awareness of reality and how to be guided by it in every key area of human life, in the pursuit of knowledge, and in the pursuit of values, whatever kind, ethical, political, aesthetic. Now, there really is, therefore, as you see, one question of philosophy. Be guided by reality. How do you, how are you guided by reality? But the answer to this question is not obvious or self-evident, not in any branch. And that's why the subject is necessary. Without philosophy, all of the following are legitimate. Without philosophy. <clears throat> the Pope says that he is in contact with reality and guided by it. In other words, by God, when he reaches decisions on faith and morals. The liar believes that he is in contact with reality. He's merely recognizing the fact that lying is a necessity of survival, since all men are crooks and they'll get him if he doesn't strike first. The power-lusting dictator believes he is in contact with reality, the reality being that man creates reality, and that if his group doesn't seize the metaphysical reins, some other group will. The modern artists believe that they are painting true reality a subconscious non-material dimension made of non-entities. John Gall holds that reality requires him to assert his rights and go on strike. Now, the question implicit in all this, before we know philosophy is, well, what then is reality? When can we say we are guided by it? What is the proper relation to it in every area? How do we know when we have achieved that relationship between consciousness and existence? As against when we have erred or are deceiving ourselves in thinking that reality is guiding us. That is what philosophy is all about. Everybody claims reality is his guide. Most everybody. Except today. But... Uh, the question of philosophy is, when is it your guide? Now on its face, this is a very different subject from physics. And two obvious differences should leap out to you immediately. One, philosophy in its essence deals with consciousness. And two, 
Philosophy is normative. In other words, it tells us what is proper, how we should behave, not as a matter of fact how we or anything else does behave. Now hold on to these points and let's go on to notice that philosophy seems to be a subject made of highly incongruous parts. You just look at it as a person not already steeped in. In one part, metaphysics, it is by far the broadest and most abstract of all human disciplines. As Aristotle put it, it is concerned simply with being qua being. But in the rest of its branches, philosophy seems to be virtually the most narrow and concrete bound subject <coughs> imaginable, dealing only with one living species on one tiny planet, and even then, only with one relationship involving that species. How much broader, <coughs> by contrast, does astronomy see, or biology, or anatomy, or even dentistry, which applies to dogs and many other animals as well. <clears throat> but despite this seeming incongruity, one fact overcomes it and restores philosophy's integrity as a subject. And that is that even in its normative, man-centered, seemingly concrete-bound branches, philosophy remains the broadest and most abstract of all subjects. Yes. I'll give you an example. Ethics, which is really a code of instructions for one small group of mammals. Ethics is broader than physics, which is the very broadest of all the physical sciences. Now, is that fantastic? No, because it's true. <clears throat> Let me give you an example here. Which principle is broader? The inverse square law of Newton, force is proportional to 1 over r squared, or that man's life requires the virtue of independence. Which is broader? Well, in the face of it, the physical principle is much wider. But in fact, it is not. Because any philosophic proposition, in ethics or whatever, is wider than any law of physics. And the key here is that independence, and this is true of all philosophic values and virtues, has as its content man's relation to reality as a total. All philosophic principles, in regard to any issue, tell man how to use his consciousness and conduct his action so as to be properly related in that issue to everything which exists, everything of every kind, including cognition, life, art, you name it. So if the two principles here, if, by contrast I wanted to say, the two principles here were the law of gravity and the principle that man needs air, then, of course, physics would triumphantly be much wider. But the real difference here is the law of gravity versus an injunction relating man to the total of reality. As far as philosophy is concerned, the law of gravity is merely a concrete under the virtue of independence. It is merely one aspect of reality that an independent man must understand first-handedly. In other words, by faith and uh, not by faith in collective wisdom or in his science teacher. And you would see this obviously if I said to you, independence means thinking about the law of gravity. That's it. Your response would immediately be, oh, that's much too narrow. That's not philosophic advice. So you see that even in, in this sense, even in its narrowest branches, including politics and aesthetics, all of philosophy comes back to reality to the total of all things, <clears throat> and the relations that consciousness should sustain to all things. Hence, philosophy in every branch is wider and more abstract than any other subject. It and it alone is truly universal in scope and domain. Now, why is philosophy the broadest and most abstract 
of all subjects. I think that's obvious to us, certainly in this audience. It has to be so by its very nature as the normative subject identifying us, identifying for us the proper relation to all of reality. As adults, we can't pursue knowledge of any specialized field properly until we know what counts as knowledge in any area and how we should think so as to gain it. And we can't pursue values properly in any specific area until we know how to evaluate. In other words, what constitutes value in any area and how we should act so as to gain it. So philosophy is very mandate as a normative discipline requires its extreme abstractness. And this same mandate, as you know, makes philosophy the base of all other subjects and pursuits. Philosophy is the fundamental science of human life on which all the more specialized disciplines and concerns rest. It is the voice telling us how to pursue those disciplines while staying in contact with reality at each point where we have choice and action. It's a pre presupposition of our then being able to go out and successfully achieve rational goals in any field. All other subjects, therefore, are hierarchically later, hierarchically later than philosophy. They presuppose that a view of the universe, of knowledge, and of values, at least in essential terms, has been developed. And that's another contrast between physics and philosophy. Physics is not generally known by people, not even implicitly, and need not be known by the non-scientist in order to lead a full, successful, rational life. Physics is a professional specialization. We can live our lives rationally from beginning to end without knowing anything about it, either explicitly or even implicitly. Philosophy, by contrast, being the basis of everything else, must be knowable in some terms by everyone, and therefore cannot require or involve specialized knowledge inaccessible to the ordinary person. Speaking in terms of essentials, anyone at any time, in any place, can and must learn philosophy in some terms with no further equipment, instrumentation, or knowledge necessary besides his senses and his brain. What philosophy gives us at least since Aristotle and the subsequent Western civilization founded on him. What philosophy gives us in particular is a view of reality, that it's independent, out there independent of us. A view of the means of knowledge, that we have to follow observation and the conclusions to which it leads. And a view of the nature of values, that we must pursue pleasure, understanding, success, in some terms, make a, a success of life on earth. And these views then enable us to conceive and pursue any more specialized subject, such as physics. Now, if O'Brien, the dictator in 1984, were correct, that dropping something down the memory hole erases it, so that there is no independent reality, then there is no cog cognition no science, no physics. Similarly, if Tertullian were right, that it is believable because it is absurd, the end of physics or science. Similarly, if Dostoevsky is right, that the enemy of values, including the value of knowledge, the enemy which will drive us insane if we don't fight and destroy it, is the fact that two and two equals four. Similarly, it's the end of science, including physics. If Augustine is right that the pursuit of earthly knowledge is nothing but a lust of the eyes. Now, there's no equivalent, I want you to note that, of this uh, issue in physics. There are no self-evident fundamentals in physics, which we must know if we are to proceed in physics or in anything else. 
At the outset, physics has only perceptions. Plus, of course, the philosophic framework that we all have, which, which makes it possible to go about studying and interpreting perceptions. <clears throat> so I've made a case that there's quite a difference between these two subjects. And I want to acknowledge that in advance because my theme today is that granting all this, there is a crucial similarity a fact about philosophy which puts it, if I can put it this way, squarely into the same epistemological bed as physics. And from now on today, I'm going to focus on the similarities between the two subjects. Similarities that are real and vital, despite their obvious differences. And here's the biggest similarity of all. Philosophy whatever its differences from physical science, still is and has to be an inductive science in every branch but metaphysics. Like physics, philosophy is and has to be an inductive science. The only exception is in metaphysics because the basic metaphysical axioms, such as existence exists or A is A, or consciousness existing as the faculty of perceiving existence, those axioms are not inductive, since they are the implicit or explicit base of all thought and inference of any kind, including inductive thought. And if you want to know how we gain knowledge of these axioms, there's a chapter in IOE and another one in OPAR. So I'm going to forget that topic. But leaving aside metaphysics now, all the other branches of philosophy, the four that set guiding norms must develop through step-by-step -step induction. Philosophic norms are not innate, nor, with a few exceptions, are they self-evident. Philosophic norms are not innate, nor, with a few exceptions, are they self-evident. They must be learned painstakingly. Precisely because they are so broad, they must be learned in typical hierarchical fashion, starting with perceptual observation and then proceeding up the necessary hierarchy just exactly as physics does. Now let's establish this. We do not learn the principles of philosophy by revelation, including revelation from Ayn Rand. We do not learn the principles of philosophy by rationalistic deduction from any set of axioms. You can stare at existence exist in A is A till you are blue in the face and turn to mold. And you can get nothing out of them as to how you should think or how you should act. They are the base, but not the base from which you can deduce philosophy. We learn philosophy only by induction from observation. So in the development of a philosophy, there has to be a period before a book like Opar can be conceived or written. There has to be a period before the norms, the virtues, the values, the standards, the ultimate statement of principles can be made. And in this period, philosophy follows the method of all knowledge because it is only a type of knowledge. Put that down. Philosophy must follow the method of all knowledge because it is itself a type of knowledge. The fact that it's the base of knowledge does not exempt it from the requirements of all knowledge. Very important to grasp that. All knowledge of reality has to be gained on the basis of observation, including the knowledge of how to gain knowledge and of how to relate our minds properly to reality. Now, if you remember my very opening sentence, my definition of induction, quote, the primary basis on which we gain knowledge that goes beyond the perceptual level. Well, if you understand that, than any subject that goes beyond the perceptual level. In other words, every subject of discipline uh, 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 requires uh, uh, philosophy. 
and has to be learned by induction. Now you may ask a question, aren't we going in a circle here? Because the norms of philosophy, I insist, must be reached by induction. And yet I also insist that we have to be guided by at least some of these very norms in order to reason at all. And therefore, specifically in order to induce. So we've got a seeming dilemma. Since philosophy is our indispensable guide to knowledge and value, we must already have some kind of knowledge and value judgments provided by philosophy to guide and ground us. And we must have them before we can induce what the guiding norm should be and in order to be able to induce it all. So where are we? We need the norms to guide us in inducing the norms. A conundrum. How is this possible? Did you ever think of that one before? That's a good one. But it has an easy answer. The axioms of metaphysics are part of the answer, but they're not the whole answer. Because as I've said, these axioms do not by themselves tell us how to pursue knowledge and value. No. What we need here, whether implicit or explicit, are abstract generalizations constituting our first knowledge of cognitive and evaluative norms. And since they're our first, they must be self-evident. And then following the guidance of these few, this small handful of norms, we have enough guidance to be able to turn to observation and gradually move up hierarchically until we reach the end and then you can write O power the equivalent. That is the pattern of developing a philosophy. And I think it'll become clearer and fuller by the end of the course. So you ask, well, where do we get our first implicit self-evident knowledge of philosophic norms? And there's only one possible source since they have to come from observation. We have to start with first level generalizations in learning philosophy. What does that make you think of? That's just what we needed to start with in physics. First level self-evident generalizations, gainable directly from observation. And we arrive at these gens in philosophy in exactly the same way as in physics. They are simply self-evident from observation. Now as adults, as in the case of physics, we can identify an abstract terms, our use of difference and agreement in order to reach these starting first level norms. But to the child and to the adult philosopher alike, primary norms are perceptual, using only observation, the base of all subsequent philosophy, just as it is in physics. Now I want to give you some examples here. Well, for one thing, there could be no norms and no obedience to norms, not even implicitly, if we don't know that we have choice. The discovery of free will is the exact parallel in philosophy to the discovery in physics that you move a ball by pushing it, if you can remember back as far as lecture one. How do you discover free will? You choose to move your arm and it goes up. You have a self-evident awareness. My decision moved my arm. I made my arm go up. By the method of difference, the only difference between the arm going up and down is you're choosing it. So right away, a gen. My decisions move my limbs. I'm assuming he's bright enough to go from arms to leg and even to go to the point of my decisions move my body. And then to observe that the same applies to directing his thought processes. I made my mind do this, the method of difference. When I wasn't willing, it didn't do it. Now this being self-evident, self-evident in each act of will, whether it involves a bodily motion or a motion within consciousness, the child quickly learns 
I make my acts happen. Generalization. My decisions, my choices cause my actions. And the implicit meaning of that, of course, is I have free will. Now, if he's a child and not just an animal, he observes other men raising their arms. And this is self-evidently the same process. So he just takes it one more level abstract and says, man is a being of volitional consciousness. Men have free will. And there, of course, he's using agreement. The common effect between him and all the others is the common cause, no matter how they otherwise differ. Now note that this is 100% certain to the beginner on the implicit level, as all first level generalizations are, just as they are in physics. Just as in physics, these first level gems require no proof and no quest for so-called relevant factors. There is no sense in asking for an analysis of other possible causal factors involved in moving your arm besides your choice. Because these generalizations are the base of all subsequent inductive knowledge and norms, including epistemological norms, and thus of the discovery of any other or future causes that might be involved. Now, it would be a wonderful thing, but it's not something I'm going to try to do here, to give you a list, because I don't think it would be a long list, of all the first level gens of philosophy. But I didn't do that in physics either, so I'm, I'm being equal minded here. Uh, but I do want to give you a few more so you get the tenor of my idea. And you yourself should be able easily to work out how agreement and difference are the abstract methods of these gens which the child grasps self-evidently and which become the base of his subsequent induction of norms. Now, I'm going to omit all academic qualifications because I haven't got time for all the other things being equals and so on. I'm going to just give you a quick sketch understanding that in writing I would make this denser and more complicated. Here's another first level gen. The child closes his eyes and the world disappears. He plugs up his ears and the music disappears. He holds his nose and the smell disappears. What is a self-evident first level gen? The senses are my only contact with what's out there. And of course, the implicit difference and agreement are obvious. When I stop my nose, I don't see my nose, therefore, etc. And what's common to them all, I use my senses, therefore I'm in contact. That's the self-evident uh, uh, first level gen, and it of course becomes the base of the later norm that the senses are valid and are the necessary foundation of any knowledge. Here's another. First level self-evident perceptually grasped norm, or uh, uh, philosophic uh, um, generalization. When I look out, I see some similarities and some differences among things. The objects of my senses fall into patterns of similarities and differences. This is self-evident generalization if ever I saw one. How would you prove that? Look. It's perceptually graspable. And that is the basis, of course, of all layer concept formation. And now here's another first level gen in philosophy. There are no pure similarities to observe, only similarities against the background of differences. And of course, if you know IOE, you'll know how that will lead us to the proper method of contextual concept formation. All these first level gens of the child, as you can see, become the self-evident axiomatic starting points of an adult when he begins to philosophize in explicit terms. And now I want to give you an example from ethics just to show you that this is totally universal. Here I regard a self-evident, perceptually graspable gem. This one may shock you. The sensation of pleasure is positive, to be desired and of pain negative 
to be escaped or avoided. I hold that, and this is true in animals too, who are purely perceptual, implicit in the experience of pleasure and pain as such is pleasure is good to be sought, pain is bad to be escaped or uh, uh, stopped. And this becomes the base of all later values. It's laid down perceptually. And here it's on the actual sensational. You don't even need the perceptual level. And if you want the details here, Ayn Rand herself elaborates on this process. I believe it's in the virtue of selfishness, where she shows us that that is the data given us by nature on which we then erect value judgments. Which does not mean that hedonism is the proper standard of value. Now let me make a clarification. Some of the first level gens of philosophy, once reached by induction, once reached by induction, can at a much later stage of knowledge be shown to be corollaries of the primary metaphysical axioms. That's irrelevant here. Even corollaries of these fundamental axioms, a corollary such as the law of causality, or the indispensability of the senses, which, are, which is a corollary of consciousness. Even these corollaries must themselves be grasped inductively first, must be grasped as first level perceptual generalizations. Only much later, once we've known them by perception and acted on them for years, can they be hooked up to the basic, can some of them be hooked up to the basic non-inductive non axioms in question. In other words, we deduce nothing from the axioms. We are not rationalists. Even the corollaries of the axioms, which one's grasped to be corollaries are self-evident implications of the axioms, even those corollaries must themselves be learned first by inductive observation. You do not get cause and effect by glaring at the law of identity and trying to manipulate it so it comes out as cause and effect. You do not deduce even the corollaries of axioms from the statement of the axioms themselves. What you do rather is first reach inductive statements and then connect them much later to an axiom by coming to see in your development that it represents, your discovery represents no more than a special focus on the axiom. And of course you can't always do that, but in many cases you can. Uh, you don't reach a special focus on existence exists, such as cause and effect, merely by staring intently at the fact of existence. Nor can you reach a special focus on consciousness, such as the indispensability of volition, merely by staring at the fact that consciousness exists. The basic axioms are necessary even to start the process of induction. So they precede any induction. But the first level inductions, no matter what their latest, later state, status, no matter what their later status, are inductions, which then serve as the base of the subsequent inductive rise of the subject. I hope that clarifies once and for all the last element of rationalism that has to be expurgated from our thought. Even the corollaries of axioms are not deducible. They are inducible. And only genius, decades later, can connect them back and say, oh yeah, this is really a special focus. Now I want to turn to another issue that we studied in physics. How do we move up the cognitive hierarchy? Now this time in philosophy. In physics, we stressed that one crucial key was experiment. And that the essence of this was the explicit controlled use of difference and agreement. Well, in philosophy, we reach more advanced knowledge essentially in the same way, by the explicit use of difference and agreement. But there is one way in which the two subjects differ, but in what I call an issue of form. For many reasons, philosophy does not use controlled experiments as such. Now, why not? In part, 
the issue of individual rights prohibits the manipulation of people. Then there's the fact that man has free will, so that the results of any given experiment would depend not only on the variables you control, but also on inherently uncontrollable and unpredictable choices. And then there's the fact that correct philosophy, to some extent, is necessary for life at all. So there is no way to control an experiment in values, for example, by taking two cases. One man or group holding pro-life values, and one where those values are purely absent, and studying the differences. Because there are no men where pro-life values are purely absent. They would be dead. Now the closest philosophy can come to an experiment in this regard is the projection of Atlantis on the one hand or the creation of Auschwitz on the other. One being the ideal, the latter methodically anti-life, an atrocity specializing in turning out walking corpses. Now as I pointed out in the ominous parallels, Auschwitz is and can properly be described as an experiment in philosophy. But it is not an experiment from which we learn the principles of philosophy. Because the Nazis needed to know their philosophy in advance in order to be able to create the destructive effects they saw. And I needed to know objectivism to identify what the Nazis were doing, without which you get what all the other commentators do when they look at it. And similarly, Ayn Rand needed to know her philosophy in order to create Atlantis, the ideal. So for these and there's other reasons still that we'll look at next time. There's no controlled experimentation in philosophy. But there are tremendous, abundant, endless cases of difference and agreement continually used by children and rational adults to reach inductive philosophic generalizations on ever higher levels. I'm going to give you the pattern here, because I think this is the equivalent of experimentation. It's the same basic principle, difference in agreement. I'm going to give you various examples, because for time, though, omitting all details and intermediate steps, you can fill them in yourselves, or take my course OT, Objectivism through induction, where I choose certain principles step by step. Now, in all the cases I'm going to use today, in order to get something done, my starting point is not going to be necessarily first level gens. I simply want to illustrate the difference in agreement pattern. So I'm going to jump around within a comparatively advanced knowledge of life. And there are many options in development to and from this point. Nevertheless, all these examples are based ultimately on the same first level philosophic generalizations. Now, for some reason, I've developed a habit of starting to discuss induction with the issue of honesty. I think because it's a simple enough virtue to make the epistemological points clear briefly, as against justice, which has so many ramifications. So let's take it in pattern schematically. A man observes the effects of a lie, say a lie to his boss. What does he see? What did he make happen? What was the effect of the difference of lying and not lying? On the simplest level, his boss is mad when he finds out. He tries to cover up the employee. One lie leads to another. He repeats the lies. Pretty soon, no job. All the method of difference, lying versus not lying, one result versus another. Now he looks at other people and other jobs who lie at work to the boss. Bad consequences there too in the end. They lose their jobs, money, home, food, etc. Lots of pain. Now I'm being very schematic here. Basic and lots of pain, that triggers off the basic first level generalization of evaluation. Pain is bad. Pleasure is good. So he is prepared now to generalize, strictly by induction. Lying to the boss is bad. Because I saw what happened when I didn't, didn't do it. 
the method of difference. And I did it three times and others did it and I saw, however different we were, the same effect, the method of agreement. So remember, there's no need to pile up cases in induction. You can have difference on just one case and agreement requires a minimum of two. But if these cases are observed and identified in accordance with the contextual knowledge available, no more instances are required. Now I want you to note here, this is a, in the nature of an aside, that difference in agreement in physics and in philosophy both are not like the typical procedure when you do research in medicine or psychology. Because in those fields, dozens of factors are considered and controlled in order to determine the cause and cure, say, of some ailment. And the reason for all these multiple controls in these fields is very simple. Not very much is really known about the causal mechanisms involved. There's relatively little scientific integration or context. You know, they argue that medicine is an art, not a science, and to some significant extent that's still true. And of course, psychology is still in the, in the pre-Socratic era. So the experimenters in these fields take a sort of stab in the dark, trying to grab onto and hold constant whatever they can imagine to be possibly relevant. But the physicist and the philosopher are in a totally different situation. They both build their observations hierarchically and know by the nature of the situation what counts as important. So they have no problem of searching out relevant factors. In other words, no problem in establishing gens via the methods of agreement and difference. Okay, back to lying. Now at that point that we reached with the man, there's no reference to any other realm in his mind. Simply lying at work to the boss is bad. Now let's say he leaves work, comes home, he observed that a teacher of his child has broken a promise. The teacher promised time off if the kids did more homework and then reneges eggs and makes them, makes them stay instead. Now the man watching sees the results. The kids become cynical. They don't trust the teacher anymore. They don't want to work anymore. Of course, he's using difference in agreement. The children before and the children after. And the agreement comes in, many children, all different, but the common effect from the common cause. I mean, we use difference in agreement as though we breathe without even naming it. And the man comes to the conclusion here, <clears throat> breaking promises at school is bad. Now you can multiply. He sees Clinton on TV. And the results on his presidency, reputation, and life, you fill it in. He reads about Iago in Othello, the arch deceiver and liar. And he sees the monstrous consequences of his actions on Cassio and on Othello and on Desdemona. Now, all these so far <clears throat> are simple gens, reached by simple difference and agreement. And they take place once an individual reaches the level of life experience where he has discovered and identified certain values, going back ultimately to a first level grasp of the good. Then is when he starts using difference and agreement to figure out the virtues necessary to achieve. So far, however, we are still on a low level of the hierarchy because the man has different observable categories of action, not yet integrated. There's lying at work, there's breaking promises at school, there's national presidential deception, there's monsters who manipulate the innocent, etc. He doesn't yet have any common denominator identified. So these are not first level, but they're still early philosophic induction. And this is the level that most people grasp easily enough and beyond which they never get. Now I'm going to indicate a man's philosophic development in general pattern and you can fill in the details because my next examples won't be even 
this sketchy. Let's look for a moment at politics. And pattern, the induction, the inductive process is exactly like ethics. Except that you have to be in your late teens and have some experience of government before you can have the interest or knowledge to start inducing in politics. Whereas you can discover much younger the evil of lying uh, to the boss or of the teacher breaking her promises to you. How would you go about inducing in politics if you're a kid? An obvious example. Your dad comes home and says he has no job anymore and we can't pay the rent. You ask him why. He says, well, the unions went on strike and they won't let me work even though I want to. And the kid says, well, why don't these men just go away since they don't like the boss's terms or salaries? What can they do to stop you from going to work on your own? And the man says, well, you see, we have a closed shop. You're not allowed to do anything unless these people agree. The kid says, well, how did we get that? And the man says, that's the policy of our government. They passed a law governing laborers that these people are entitled to their demands, however outrageous, and no one else can enter if they don't agree. And the kid says, his first early gen in politics, our labor laws are bad. An early start. He watches TV and he sees that from 7.30 to 8, it's much more boring than the rest of the time. Why? It's explained to him that the FCC has mandated boring programming for that period. Of course, it's a method of difference. Before and after the FCC. He moves to New York, but there are no apartments. Why? Rent control. And you see, I think, where we're heading inductively. And he starts to see the common denominator. Agreement. Now, he'll reach the same general conclusion about government much sooner if he takes a decent history course. He discovers, for example, the difference between life in ancient Egypt when there was no progress for many centuries under the all-powerful God Kings, as against Greece, where under democracy there was a glorious burst of achievement. Yes, I said democracy, and I'll explain that in a moment. The point here is that, as with lying, we reach a number of discrete generalizations based on observation. Labor laws are bad. Egypt's pharaohs were bad. Rent control is bad, etc. Now I've given you only the negative side. But this is the mentality of a typical Christian conservative today. He knows all those things and he goes no further. Now, I've left out the positive equivalence which the inducer must also observe or think up as a contrast if, if his induction is to be fully clear to him. Otherwise, he's going to collapse into anarchism or libertarianism as the alternative. Now, before I switch and give you an example in epistemology, let's take a five-minute break here. I want to indicate to you the same pattern of generalization through agreement and difference now in epistemology. And it works exactly like I make the ball move. After uh, Here's a, a, a pattern, a typical sort of inductive pattern. First you get to, I make mommy move by crying. And then you get a gen. Asking her for things helps you get them. That's a gen. Now their audience is pitch black. What happened? Can you take notes in that darkness? Oh, there, okay. Asking her for things helps you get them. And then in school, he observes the teacher telling us things enables us to learn. And then when I say to Sally, gee, you're pretty, she likes me. 
a big inductive leap, but absolutely certain through agreement. Talking is important. And that's a big integration of the previous generalizations. And then he notices another gen. Animals don't talk. So man alone can talk. That's a higher level gen built on the earlier ones. Now the inducer at this point has no idea why talking is important. What it really consists of. How it ties into man's other unique achievements. The connection to all these other issues and the wider gens involved comes later in the hierarchy. But of course you see with your advanced knowledge that I'm working here toward the first inductive leads to the issue of concepts in human life. Now I could keep multiplying examples indefinitely and you should do just that if you want to learn philosophy. One more example. Take the gen, man needs a definite method of knowledge. It's not enough to just simply spurt out, spew out whatever he feels like. How do we get that from induction? And here's a hint. You fear something will happen, but it doesn't. Your fear was misplaced and you see it. You want something badly but it turned out to be really hurtful to you. You followed God's commandments and you ended up in the gutter. You followed society's commandments and you ended up in your psychiatrist's office. Agreement, what is common to all these disasters? Emotion slash authority. And you accept authority because you feel awe and fear. Inference. I can't trust emotions or authority. I need something better to come to conclusions. You're on your way to the idea of a need a method. Now this very process of induction, by the way, took place, but it took mankind literally thousands of years until Aristotle to reach the end of this process and make it explicit. Now, just before we leave uh, difference and agreement in regard to philosophic gens, I want to indicate that there are four major sources for an individual to observe the data necessary to discover these gens. Four major sources. <clears throat> the first is his own personal life and dealings with people including introspection in his study of others. The kind of things he himself observes, and we've already illustrated that. If you've read Ayn Rand's journals, <clears throat> you know how her observation of a girl at work, in contrast to herself, led her to Rourke versus Keating and all the gens that this involved. Or how her observations of herself in a bad mood led her to all the gens later dramatized in Dominique. A second major source is history. You remember Ayn Rand's statement that history is the laboratory of philosophy. Not that it's an area of controlled experiments, but it does offer abundant material for philosophic difference and agreement. Just think of what one can induce about ethics, politics, epistemology, philosophy, Think of the many kinds of causal sequences one can discover by observing Egypt versus Greece, Athens versus Sparta, the Middle Ages versus the Renaissance, the American Revolution versus the French, America before the Kantian invasion and after, East Germany versus West Germany before the wall came down, the barbaric Muslims today versus the civilized West, the barbaric West in 1300 versus the civilized Muslims, etc. A gold mine for philosophic uh, 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 agreement and difference leading to generalizations. Number three source, literature. Now I deliberately put Yago in as a hint of this, but I mean great novels and plays, objectivist and otherwise are filled with convincing good and bad characters. 
and reveal the consequences of their moral character on themselves and on others. And this represents another huge laboratory for the inducer to discover cause and effect in human behavior. You can discover valid principles of ethics simply from truthful characterizations leading to logical results as in Anna Karenina or crime and punishment. Now fourth, the least valuable, I put it last, is the world seen today. In other words, newspaper stuff and front page headlines. This is the least valuable as inductive material because neither the passage of time nor an historian's or artist's skill nor our own personal participation has essentialized this mass of material. Plus, with few exceptions, we, the readers of the New York Times et al., have little real familiarity with the events being discussed. If we already know philosophy, we can easily evaluate what we are told. But to learn philosophy from the newspapers, especially today's newspapers, the best I can say is it's a highly improbable and emotionally ugly way to proceed. Now, if I can put a side plug in for something here, you can see from what I've been saying some pedagogical implications as to what a proper curriculum for children in grade school should and should not include. And I must say that there's only one school today, to my knowledge, that understands all these implications in full, and that is the Van Damme Academy, to which I am proud to be a financial, let alone moral, contributor. That's my plug. Now, just as in physics, let us now, in philosophy, ascend even further up the hierarchy. We went from first level gens available to direct perception through a whole series of early gens available to observation via difference and agreement, given our first level base. Now we're going to integrate clusters of our early gens into higher level gens. In other words, just as in physics, we're going to pass from gens to principles. Now, principle represents a higher level of integration in a given context. It means the integration of generalizations. For example, I would not say that Kepler's laws are principles, although each explains a variety of astro astronomical data. But they do not integrate <coughs> other and previous generalizations in the same field, namely astronomy. By contrast, I would say that Copernicus's viewpoint, granted it's helped along both by Kepler and Galileo, but I would say that Copernicus does introduce a valid principle for the first time into the study of the solar system. A vast number of earlier gens about heavenly bodies, gens, were integrated and explained for the first time by the generalization that the planets move around the sun as against the geocentric viewpoint. And in regard to this broad general overview of uh, Copernicus, Kepler's propositions about the orbits of the planets, though vital, are merely one aspect. And this is part of the reason why we validly speak glowingly of the Copernican revolution and not of the Keplerian revolution. Now, let's just continue in physics for a minute. Jumping now, to the extreme in classical mechanics. We go from principles to reach Newton with his laws of motion and of gravity. And here we reach not just principles in a relatively early context, but the fundamental principles of the field in our total context today. Now I hope you can see the parallel process of going inductively from gens to principles to fundamentals in philosophy a purely inductive process. The inducer puts together his earlier ethical observations on Lyme and promise breaking and Clinton, etc. Perhaps also having discovered since the importance of not lying to himself and reaches a huge integration. Honesty is important. A very abstract statement. 
People must be honest or they will suffer and ultimately lose the values they seek. Difference in agreement all over the place. He takes this huge inductive leap to a principle with the same confidence as the scientist leap because he too now has the necessary context and knows what is relevant and what is not. And therefore he knows what need not be considered in this issue such as the religious or altruistic motives of the liar or his charming demeanor. He throws all that out because he knows what are the first or early gens from which he, was, he is now inducing this wider one. Now let's jump higher still. Suppose that our inducer has grasped justice the same way as he grasped honesty by successive difference in agreement and by integrating a whole series of lower level gens. And he's grasped still other virtues by this method. Now each of these it represents a principle of proper action, which explains a whole cluster of lower level gens. And then now say he integrates all these principles of virtue into the supreme principle of rationality. This is almost, not quite yet, but almost the equivalent in philosophy of JCM's field equations. Because now the inducer, let us say, let us say, he doesn't yet know the full story about man's nature or mind, but he has reached a profound knowledge about the entity man and his, his actions. A profound connection between a cause and its effect. Namely, if a man acts according to reason, he achieves his values, if not, not. And this is not a floating abstraction to him because by the time and by the method he reached it, it is crammed full of knowledge about truth and lies, work versus sloth, fairness versus prejudice, etc. It's not something he deduces from empty generalities. Like, this is man's means of knowledge, therefore it's his means of survival, therefore it's not a rationalistic structure. It's a high level gen by successive inductions. Uh, we're still using agreement and difference. We're asking what is the same among these virtues that is responsible for the fact that they all lead to success? What is the similarity of cause that leads to the similarity of effect? And we're also asking what is the difference between each policy and its opposite? the difference that is responsible for success or failure, the difference that makes the difference. So again, in all of our jumps from level to level, the leap is done through agreement and difference. Now, of course, the same rising process occurs in the political realm. We integrate the evil of the FCC and the labor laws and the ancient pharaohs, etc., as against the United States. We reach the principle that the individual must be left free Again, the integration of a whole series of gens and thus the principle of limited government. And simultaneously, another more technical uh, progression. We integrate the generalization that emotions are, trust are untrustworthy as means of knowledge and that there are no infallible authorities and that man therefore needs a method. That's a principle. And that logic, thanks to Aristotle, is the method. That's a more basic principle. And all of that leads eventually to the full statement of the underlying epistemological principle, almost an irreducible fundamental, <coughs> but not quite yet, the principle of objectivity as defined in full for the first time by Ayn Rand. And now getting ready for a gigantic inductive leap, but already prepared with the necessary context, each level of the hierarchy that's getting us there. We integrate the following. Rationality is necessary in action. Thinking, individual thinking is necessary in society. Objective thinking is necessary for knowledge. What integrates it all? Reason is the crucial attribute of man. It's his means of knowledge and action, of survival. And here we finally have a true fundamental, a super integration 
in the sense that I use that term, one that wraps up all the preceding principles, that states the cause that man by his nature must enact in every branch of activity, from epistemology to politics and aesthetics, if he is to achieve the positive effects he seeks. Now I hope you see that the, what I've been saying is the only method, and I've just sketched the pattern, is the only method by which we can reach fundamentals in philosophy. It's a series of inductions and then bolder inductions, like Newton and like Ayn Rand. But the leaps are not blind or uncertain because they are integrations which explain and integrate lower level generalizations going all the way back down to our starting point of first level directly observable gens. Now I hope you see the absolute similarity on this vital inductive issue between physics and philosophy. In both cases, gens lead to principles and both gens and principles are essential to the very existence of the subject. Let's pause on that for a minute. Without principles, physics would be a welter of disconnected empirical gens. These couldn't be retained as a whole and nothing cognitive could be done with them. It would be like a positivistic universe, simply describing unintelligible uniformities in experience. No integration, no way to reach fundamental causes or any explanation. Now the same is true of, in philosophy. Without principles, we have a welter of generalities which add up to nothing and cannot even be methodically obeyed, like the Ten Commandments. The crow simply cannot hold them in mind when it makes choices, so they cease to function effectively as norms. In both physics and philosophy, early general generalizations alone without the later integrations are dead ends. And that, of course, is the dead end of the empiricist approach. But in both subjects also, principles without early level gens are also a dead end because that approach represents the arbiter, not based on observation. In other words, it's the dead end of rationalism. Now, if you understand how to reach broad basic principles in physics and philosophy, you can answer the question whether your principles are objective. And the answer is yes, they are in both subjects. And don't say, oh, yes, they are because they have been, quote, proven. That is an inadequate statement. They're objective because they have been proven inductively which is the only kind of proof of generalizations or principles that is possible or valid or objective. Objectivity, remember, means not just that you've been a nice boy. It means reducibility to perceptual observation. In other words, reducibility down the hierarchy to direct first level gens. And that is precisely the status of proper principles both in physics and in philosophy because these principles were reached step by step going upwards. That's assuming you use the right inductive method. Now, I'd like to take a few minutes for a rather lengthy side comment here. I could cut it, but I think it it's comes up here and it should be helpful in anyone's effort to understand objectivism fully. To connect your principles to reality, it is not enough to be able to give examples of them. If that is all you can do, then you do not understand the principles and you will not be able to apply them correctly. You must derive the principles step by step from first level gens on the pattern given today. In other words, it is not enough to take a principle told to you by others and then set about seeing it in reality. You must get it yourself from reality. Now in physics, this is obvious. We can see examples of gravity. We can see unsupported things falling to the earth. So gravity, if you'll forgive the pun, gravity is not a floating abstraction. But that does not give you the understanding of gravity that you get if you learn it hierarchically, the way Newton did on the pattern we indicated a few days ago. Now I want to give you a pure metaphor here. You can see the ground from a magic carpet, let us say, on a clear day. 
So you're not fog bound as in a floating abstraction, but you still have no stairway down or up from the carpet to the ground. Now all this applies equally to philosophic principles. Take independence again. Let us suppose you can point to authentic examples of independence and its opposite. You know what you mean by independence as Rourke, as against Keating, he's dependent. So you do know the reference, but what you don't know is all the things that deriving the difference inductively and hierarchically would have taught you. The context of this virtue, its forms or varieties, the various types of consequences that will ensue if you do or don't obey it, its relation to other principles, etc. You see, you do not know an item if you merely jump in blindly on some level of a hierarchy unknown to you and then say, here are some good examples of it. So the moral of this is this. Concretizing your abstractions is a good first step in tying them to reality. But it is only a first step in a much longer marathon. If you remember that, you may find it helpful. And you won't delude yourself into thinking you really understand when you don't. That's the end of my aside. Now back to philosophy and physics. Before completing our discussion of the progression from first level gens all the way back to fundamental principles, I want to make another important point and name another similarity between physics and philosophy. One applicable throughout both subjects development from first level gens on up. And I mean here the principle that I stressed abundantly in physics of concepts as being the green light to induction. We've seen in physics why valid concepts such as speed, field, energy, why these are essential to continuing up the hierarchy, and why invalid concepts lead to dead ends. The same is true in spades in philosophy. Look at Ayn Rand's concept. Now I'm talking about the concept, the word of objectivity, which in her treatment is essentially a new concept, although it was prepared in many ways by Aristotle. Now earlier, I indicated some inductions that might lead to this concept. But now consider the inductions flowing from it. The gens and principles that it once formulated makes possible throughout philosophy. Jump in anywhere. If objectivity is a norm, then art must be objective. So non-representational painting is not art. And if there's such a thing as individual rights, they must be objective. So they're absolutes, not subject to collective whim or supernatural decree. And laws must be objective, so the antitrust laws are evil. And only the natural is objective because only it is reducible to sense data. Therefore, goodbye to God, etc. Now you see a vast torrent of knowledge of general asations in field after field made possible by a certain concept of objectivity. The concept is the green light to a whole series of truths. Now contrast this with the Kantian Hegelian concept. And again, I mean the concept of the objective by which they mean the collective. Now with this concept, the objective as the collective, what kind of gens do you inevitably reach? Well, since anything is objective, if the collective approves, objective loses its tie to reality. Its norman of meeting becomes, in essence, obey. Obey the consensus of others. What is the gen that's implied? Others are the infallible authority. So, another gen comes out of this concept. Each individual must sacrifice and submit to others. Now in this case, a whole process of thought, 
The very activity of thought as such, including inductive thought, is aborted at its root by a single invalid concept. Now let's take another example of this same issue in regard to the concept of man. You know all the good gens that can be reached with the definition of man as a rational animal. Now consider what happens to induction and to gens if you define man as the social animal. Very common definition. And I'm looking at it specifically from the point of view of the green or red light to induction. This in essence, this social animal definition, equates man with ants and therefore cuts off all the inductive integrations based on his distinctive nature as a rational being. As an example of the false inductions generated by an invalid concept, take what we see today around us as a result. The common generalization, we all need love, man needs love. Now, of course, this is true in the sense of we need men who share rational, life-supporting values with us, and we need to experience the appreciation of our achievements that flows from such a source. But this kind of need of love is applicable only within the context of rationality being the measure of value. Only if one starts with the concept of reason as being essential to the concept man. But if man is essentially a social, not a rational animal, then the induction about love which follows has no qualifications or preconditions. It is simply all men, since sociality is their essence, need approval or love as a primary, which is how exactly how people take it, which means all men are Peter Keatings, which induction renders irrelevant all such issues as free will, or what kind of love do we need, or from whom, or how should it be pursued, etc. A whole area is either aborted or utterly distorted by one incorrect concept. I hope you see now more clearly, and now, now we see it in philosophy also, what I mean when I say that valid concepts and only valid concepts are green light to true inductions. And that's why the crucial importance in both physics and philosophy of the abstract thinker, the one who can abstract away from concrete boundedness and thereby reach valid abstractions and principles. And this was exactly Newton's genius, his abstract ability, his ability to look past differences that had stopped previous thinkers, his ability to see integrating similarities and throw out non-essential differences such as the difference between falling and circling, or orbiting. Now this kind of abstract ability is what is required in all higher level concept formation, and therefore in the discovery of all higher level generalizations. And I'm sure you understand, you in this audience, how the same attribute and the same praise belong in philosophy to Ayn Rand. You see, the similarities that need to be grasped to form the concept table are pretty obvious. Only a mentally retarded adult would say, well, look, one table is square and another is round. How can you possibly put them together under one term? But on the higher levels of concept formation, this is precisely the way most people's minds do work. Just as before Newton, they could see no essential similarity between orbiting and falling. So today in philosophy, they cannot see a similarity between the communism of Soviet Russia some decades back and the welfare state statism of America today. They see the differences clearly. One table is round and one is square, but their minds cannot abstract to the essential similarities. So they are stopped in thinking about politics any further. They can make no generalizations about the causes or effects of statism as such. They cannot discover the laws of statism or of freedom. Their inductive capacity in this area is simply aborted. What aborted it? Their inability to form a higher level concept. Their inability to think abstractly. Generalization is merely an expression of conceptualization. A form of conceptualization. So I can't repeat too often that the first rule of any valid generalization 
its proper concept formation. I would go so far almost as to say the following. With valid concepts, it takes an effort to go wrong in induction. Without them, it is impossible to go right. That is a, a literary overstatement, which is much more true than overstatement. Now I want you on this point to remember the alchemists we mentioned who differentiated falsely among various forms of antimony on the basis of how it was produced. Well, we have the exact same alchemists in philosophy. And that is the people who cannot see that conservatives and liberals are the same since one is produced by religion and the other by Marxism. It's the same as burning by lead and burning by sulfur. Or you remember the earlier chemists who we mentioned who equated all gases with air and how no progress could be made until this package deal was broken up? Well, the exact same thing in dead end occurs all over philosophy. People, for instance, who integrate into one concept, the satisfaction of any desire, no matter how, and that's what they call selfishness. Or people who put together in one concept any frustration that others cause me, no matter what, and call that enslavement. Same methodology, same disastrous results. Let's go on now to a new point, another crucial similarity between physics and philosophy. We're going to continue discussing the process of moving up from gens to principles and to the climax, the fundamentals which explain the rest. And the point here is that the fundamentals which explain the rest are themselves irreducible, as are the laws of Newton or the field equations of JCM. There cannot be an infinite series of whys. Sooner or later, one must reach simply, it is. And this fact is equally true in philosophy. In metaphysics, the irreducible is the fact of existence. And nothing is more ludicrous than Martin Heidegger, who said that the basic question of philosophy is why is there anything at all and not rather nothing? A question which I'm sure he got from introspection. Huh? Uh, in the normative branches, there are also, there is also an irreducible principle. And that is, the normative branch is philosophy. There's also an irreducible principle. And what is that? Irreducible. You can't explain it. You can't get underneath it. Human consciousness is conceptual. Or if you want to add in the fact that organisms with locomotion survive by the guidance of their consciousness, we can word this fundamental, man survives by the guidance of his conceptual faculty. But suppose now you ask, why is man's faculty of survival of such a kind? Why does he survive by concept? Or you read IOE and you ask, why is measurement omission the kind of consciousness we have rather than something else? I actually asked Ayn Rand this question once. Uh, I mean, I was very daring. And her answer was to look at me as only she could and say calmly and quietly, it is. Now, this point, by the way, holds true no matter what correlations are subsequently found, if any, between consciousness and the brain. It will still be a case of, given X kind of brain, Y kind of consciousness uh, goes with it. And why is this so? It is. So now let us ask, how can we possibly validate utterly universal statements about man's consciousness and means of survival? And the answer? Just exactly the same way we validated the atomic theory. Do you remember the principle? We did this uh, yesterday. The integration of fundamentals from every intensively studied field. That's exactly what the basic principles I just mentioned do in philosophy. They integrate all the data 
all the earlier information in all the branches. And I've explained this in detail, actually, in OPA, how the nature of human concept formation within the framework of an absolute reality is the superintegration, although I didn't use that word, how the nature of human concept formation is the superintegration that explains and unites all the principles of epistemology, ethics, politics, and aesthetics. How each of them, with all their norms, flow from man's distinctive mode of grasping existence. So it's the same thing with the atomic theory and the theory of man. To reach and validate the broadest fundamentals, evidence from all the different facets of human nature and action have to be brought in. And that's what we did bring in in the patterns I sketched. We need to amass observations and lower level gens from personal observation, from historical data of all kinds, from man in production, et cetera, et cetera. Formulate our, our lower level fundamentals and then rise inductively, continually integrating, tying each area into fundamentals until in the end one reaches the overarching fundamental, the super integration. Both philosophy and physics are a quest for fundamentals. For the broadest principles are the super integrations by which to integrate the greatest amount of data. And just as fundamentals are the key to inductive certainty on the broadest levels in physics, because of the degree of integration they represent, the same is true in philosophy. If the criterion of a valid scientific theory, a scientific theory, if the criterion of a valid scientific theory is fundamental integration, then philosophic theories are far and away the most scientific of all theories, because that precisely is the defining nature and goal of philosophy. Philosophy is preeminently the science of fundamentals. Now notice also before we leave induction in philosophy, that we follow in regard to it the dual method of validation that we've been following, that I discussed in OPAR. We follow it in philosophy as in physics. In induction everywhere, proof is a combination of reducibility and integration, and both of which we've now mentioned in regard to philosophy. And now our last topic for today, the nature of inductive errors in philosophy. You see, I'm following the same order of points today in regard to philosophy that I did in regard to physics, and just checking off the similarities point for point between the two subjects. And I ended in physics with inductive error, so let's look at that subject in philosophy. Here again, philosophy and physics are similar. We see all the same kinds of errors in philosophy as we discussed under inductive errors in physics, except that people are much more emotionless than authoritarian in philosophy, because they have not yet discovered induction or scientific method in philosophy. And in philosophy, we also see and openly advocate the same approaches to thought that were so destructive of physics and of induction in physics. We see the intrinsicist with his mystic authoritarian offspring and the subjectivist with his skeptical emotionless offspring. In other words, the same type of induction distorting ideas that throw people off in regard to the material world occur in philosophy too, but brazen and unchallenged in philosophy. And I'm sure you know plenty of examples without needing me to fill them in. Notice also here when we're discussing errors that philosophy like physics is self-corrective if approached as a factual, rational, inductive field of study. For example, in politics, the Greeks in their freest period held that the alternative to theocracy or autocracy was democracy. They were groping for, but never reached, the idea of each man controlling his own destiny. But that very groping after the horrible delay of Christianity with the dark and middle ages, that very groping made possible Locke's formulation of rights and therefore made possible Jefferson, who along with Madison then showed what was wrong with the idea of democracy. Now I ask you, is this not an exact parallel in philosophy? 
to the self-corrective nature of physics, to the sequence in which Kepler makes Newton possible, who then turns around and corrects the very law of Kepler which led him to his own law of gravity. To get rid of error in induction, in philosophy as in physics, you need to know and follow an explicit rational methodology, one which covers all the essential questions of principle the inducer faces. And I've already given you what I know on this subject. Given this methodology, any errors one makes in any rational subject are self-correcting in due course. Without this methodology, however, induction is strangled before it starts. And then people have nothing to do but moan about the problem of induction, which problem, in fact, doesn't exist, as I hope you're starting to see. Now, let me leave you. Look how short I've been. And I had a lot of interruptions from technical causes. So I'm almost within reasonable limits today. I want to leave you with a question to think about for tomorrow's lecture our final one in this course. If there are all these many inductive similarities between philosophy and physics, as I have been discussing, why has the inductive nature of philosophy been even questioned or ignored? Why, if it's so obvious in so many ways? Now, in small part, it's because people focus on the issue of controlled experiments. But I regard that as an insignificant issue in this context because of the wider issue of difference and agreement, that the policy of using those methods that's common to both physics and philosophy. The major issue here is not experiment, but in a word, mathematics. Mathematics, we know thoroughly by now, is essential to induction in physics. But mathematics is inapplicable to philosophy. Yes, it is. So how can we possibly say that philosophy uses the induction like physics does? Let me put it to you another way, the problem. Physics would not be a science without mathematics. Philosophy cannot use mathematics. So how can both be using the same scientific method? You get the full force of that question. Next time, I'm going to give you my solution to this problem, the most difficult and I think the most important in the whole course. And I believe that that's going to lead us finally to answer the very deepest question about induction, namely, what is its basis in the very nature of human consciousness? Now, see if you can figure that one out before I tell you in person tomorrow. Thank you very much. Now, I want to begin uh, by apologizing uh, the question period uh, it comes after two hours of lecturing, and apparently this stuff is difficult for me. And by the time I get to the question period, I'm not functioning too well, but I have a lifetime automatized habit when something bothers me about my answer of going over it till a better formulation occurs to me. And I failed on two questions yesterday, which then buzzed around until I realized what was wrong. So let me take those two over again first. I got this question on what is the difference between the objectivist razors and Occam's razor? You know, the concepts must not be multiplied beyond necessity, general gens must not be multiplied beyond necessity versus Occam. And it, the answer suddenly struck me as obvious uh, when I got home. The objectivist razors are epistemological. Occam's is metaphysical. The objectivist says, when you create a tool of cognition, like a concept, or you create a union of concepts, you're doing so for a cognitive purpose. 
and do so only when it advances that purpose. If it's useless or harmful, don't do it. But Occam's razor is used in a context of metaphysics where there's no issue of purpose. There's an issue of does something exist or doesn't it? And it says simply, it doesn't exist if something simpler can exist. There are no epicycles because we can get along without them. That is metaphysics. And you can't make a, a simplicity a criterion of reality. I think that's a much clearer answer than the one I stumbled around with last time. Now the other one that I gave up on because it just struck my mind as unanswerable, I was too tired, but then occurred to me as obvious when I got home, was the gentleman who said, Newton's calculus rests on metaphysical continuity and yet atomism proves that reality is not continuous and therefore doesn't atomism refute Newton. Now, you know, on a purely rationalistic basis, that stopped me cold. But then I thought, what are we actually talking about? Continuous still apply, and let's just go down to the particle level for a minute. Continuous still apply to the actions of atoms. For example, if they move, they move on a continuum. They have increasing velocities and instantaneous velocities, increasing accelerations, there's varying continual force operating on them, etc. The fact that they are particles doesn't mean that they don't function on continuum. And the same thing is true of macroscopic objects. Even though they're made of particles, there is still such a thing as a baseball which acts as one unit, one continuous whole. You know, obviously, that in a solid, the particles are closely bound together. So all continuities apply to them, to their actions, to their attributes. Even their mass, it's still true that there is a continuum of mass. So the fact that these things are made of particles does not in any wit deny the facts of continuity on the particle level or on the macroscopic level, which Newton is concerned with. In fact, in integral calculus, he's even concerned to take the particles and put them together into a whole. Another way of putting it is the macroscopic world is still real, even if there's also the microscopic world. Now, the person did not ask, but could have asked the reverse question. He asked, how do you reconcile continua with particles? But he could have asked, how do you reconcile particles with the continuum, namely the ether, which is a continuum filling the whole universe? And here my best answer is an analogy given me by Dave Harriman when I asked that question. He said, it's like raisins in a pudding. That's the particles in the ether. He didn't tell me what flavor pudding. Uh, now I've got some nice written questions. Some people had, I guess you'd call it the courage to send them in at nine o'clock this morning, uh, which is not exactly giving me a lot of time. Was that the sending of the folio? Well, that's when I got it anyway. Uh, now let's take some live ones. Yes, is that Betsy? Go ahead. Okay, how would you judge this dispute between a physicist and a philosopher? The physicist... That would be a philosophic dispute. Oh, it is. It's over oh. math and experimentation. And, uh, uh, the physicist says, my experiment leads to this conclusion. And the philosopher says, your conclusion contains a contradiction, and I reject it. The physicist says, this is armchair philosophizing. You haven't even looked at my experiment or done the math. That, okay, let me stop you right now. That is 100% I'm on the side of the philosopher. And the reason is the hierarchy of knowledge. The absence of contradiction is a precondition of all knowledge, including physics. Therefore, if it is really true that the physicist has led to a contradiction, he is out. It makes no difference what math, what experiment. All you can say to him is you must have misinterpreted your physics, you must have misinterpreted your experiment, or you have made a mistake in your deduction. 
The laws of logic trump everything because without them there isn't anything. So there's no such thing as on one side is logic and on the other is experiment. How do you mediate? There's no experiment without logic. Next. Dr. Peacock, you said before that phys uh, What's Apollo, your name? Adrian Apollo. You said Adrian, okay. you said before that physics can only veto ideas in the sciences, the special sciences. Physics or philosophy? That philosophy can only veto certain ideas in physics, but can't cannot play a constructive role. Yeah. But, but couldn't you have a certain kind of construction role under the idea of no other alternative being conceivable? such as what would philosophy, give me an example of a physical theory that philosophy would come up with. Are you talking about the planum or something more specific? I was thinking of the idea that there could be, I can, can't conceive of any other alternative to only entities existing. This seems to tie into the question of the atomic theory of matter. No, no, no. Philosophy, we can say that entities uh, did everyone hear that question? Can philosophy make projections about reality simply on the grounds of what's philosophically conceivable and therefore have a positive role to play in physics and not merely a veto power? And the answer is no, it cannot. We can say, your example was entities. We can say that entities are primaries in our cognition, that they exist on the perceptual level and that all of our knowledge is based on that. That does not mean we can ascribe entities to the ultimate constituents of reality, such as the ether, if we call it that, just to name the unknown. Before we can say what is the ultimate constituents of reality, we have to become omniscient. We would have to know everything in order to say what we have cannot be reduced any further. There's nothing else left to know. No other category left for it to fit into. So we cannot sit in an armchair and say, entity, action, so on, are <clears throat> indispensable to on the perceptual level. Therefore, the ultimate reality, what I call in, uh, in OPAR, what did I call puffs of meta-energy, must be entities. We have to wait and see what we find. Now, we're not going to find anything contradicting the world we observe, but we may find categories or forms of existence that we do not know now that, are, that underlie and r give rise to entities and so on as we know them now. So you cannot use philosophy to say, I can't conceive anything more, therefore physicists have to take this. But what, that doesn't mean it's a free reign to physicists. They still have to be able to reduce their conclusions to the perceptual level. And that means two entities. But what they reduce may be something very, very different from entities. What it is, don't ask me. That's precisely what I can't project. That's up to physicists to give us a concept, a definition. That will, uh, that will enable us to grasp that, even if it's something very different from entities as we know them. Now, it's obviously what exists is an entity in ultimate reality, if you mean by that a something. Obviously, it's a something versus a nothing. So in that sense, entity is deeply metaphysical and must be a constituent of ultimate reality. But that's not saying a great deal. A puff of meta energy is a something. So, you know, you don't get very far in philosophy unless you re make it so abstract that it doesn't tell you anything about physical reality. Uh, that's my answer to your question. Next. Hi, it's Eric Daniels. Uh, you, oh, mentioned, hi. Uh, you mentioned in your lecture yesterday that the concept of energy provided uh, a big green light to, uh, I think you said, dozens of new uh, generalizations and that you had three or so that you wanted to talk about but nobody asked you, so I figured I'd ask you if you could mention a few of those. Well, that's great because I just happen to have a few notes here. 
And actually, I got a written question. Could you talk about how the concept of energy acted as a green light? And I had a fascinating talk with Dave one day. He listed about a dozen discoveries of great importance made possible by the law of conservation of energy, which of course would itself have been impossible without the concept of energy. And as he explained it to me, the general pattern is that some occurrence would seem to contradict the law of conservation of energy. And therefore something new, some new source of energy or of its transformation comes to be known. And so we have discoveries which would not have occurred had the observer not been convinced that energy must be conserved. <clears throat> and here are three examples that I took notes on. Radioactivity. Pierre Curie observed that radium gave rise to more heat than could be explained by any known energy source. There was no chemical or any other known process that could account for it. So the energy it was discovered came from nuclear decay, which was the beginning of nuclear physics. And they ultimately found it to be alpha decay, in other words, the emission of helium nuclei. So it opened up the whole field of radioactivity, which would never have been there without the concept of energy to give rise to the law of conservation of energy. Here's another one. It was necessary to explain the huge amount of heat emanating from the sun. There was so much energy out, far more powerful than anything we know, that a new source for generating energy within the sun must exist. Here again, nuclear processes, in this case fusion, were hypothesized as the source. You see a whole world of discovery opened up by a concept. And thirdly, the discovery of new particles, such as the neutrino. This is a particle with no charge and almost no mass. And it was, in essence, a deduction from the law of conservation of energy. Because particle interactions were detected that seemed to violate the law. There was more energy in the particles at the beginning than at the end. Some of the energy seemed to be disappearing. So the conclusion, there must be a new type of particle carrying away the energy being lost. Now these are three, he gave me a dozen, but after three I got the point, uh, and I, I didn't take down any more, but it's, it would be a fascinating book. I'm going to have probably a chapter in my book, but it would be a fascinating book of its own right to say what concepts have made possible in science. Just the concept and then list the dozens of generalizations, new fields, fantastic discoveries that were closed if you hadn't first formed the file fold. Uh, uh, that's why I, I insist as a crucial formulation on uh, 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 concepts as the green light to uh, induction. Next, yes. Uh, hi Leonard, it's John Lewis. My, John, question, yeah. my question relates to your concept of induction as the primary process of moving beyond observation. It seems within yeah. that primary process there are deductive and inductive elements in the well, sense... I already covered that, John. I already covered that by saying deduction is not primary. The question is, are there two concepts of induction involved here? from particulars to generalization, or is it a, a term with two senses? That's my question. No, it's only one sense. It's generalization. That is the process by which we go beyond the perceptual level. We go from some to all. From, from what we experience to what we don't experience. And all that deduction does is once we have a generalization, apply it to another case. So the deduction is not primary, it presupposes the induction. Yeah, I understand that it's not primary. Okay. Uh, okay? Okay. Next question. Uh, Doug Mayfield, you've made analogies between physics and philosophy, but tried to keep them distinct. Are well, there more than analogies, identities. Identities. Are there areas that are sort of borderline cases where the philosopher and the physicist both have to look at them? And the example I would give would be the issue of space. Is space an entity unto itself, or is space uh, a distinctly measured quantity between entities? Is this a 
question of physics. Well, <laughs> who gets space is the question you're saying, physics or philosophy? I, I think technically you would have to say that space belongs to physics. Now that's not giving them very much since space is nothing. But <clears throat> nevertheless, technically, philosophy, metaphysics does not cover time and space. It is Kant who brought those into philosophy. Time and space, Aristotle covered them under physics. They are relations that pertain to the physical world. They are not universal. And consequently, they don't belong under metaphysics. Now, if somebody comes along and says a relational phenomenon is an absolute entity, it's appropriate when that is explained that that's what's being done for a philosopher to say on epistemological grounds, wrong. You can't convert a relation into an entity. But that's all the philosopher can do is you show him that this is what's being done, and he says, okay, you know, just as you show him that this is a contradiction, he says contradictions are out. But the primary, there's no borderline there. That belongs to physics. Yes. Uh, hi, this is Greg Salmeri. Hi, uh, Greg. In your talk last year about your book, uh, the integration in physics, the problem of induction was going to be one chapter. You uh, mm -hmm. seem to have moved beyond that. What are your current plans for writing? Well, my current plans after I recover from five lectures in seven days, um, I'm going to write the book, but it's going to have a radically different focus. Instead of two parts with induction, one chapter and one part, it's going to be one book on induction in physics and philosophy. And all the rest of the material is either going to be a side note or the whole issue of the dim hypothesis, I think, if I last long enough, will be a short follow-up book uh, because this is much more fundamental and much more important and much more difficult. So while I have a handle on this, and there's a lot of things on induction I couldn't cram into, uh, 11 hours. So I think I want to write that book first. And as a matter of fact, to show you the difference in my orientation, I'll tell you about my vanity plates. My old license plate was one in many. And I just applied the other night for the new one because the license plate indicates my basic intellectual orientation. I just applied for the new one, which is not taken in California, to my amazement. And it is all SSP. So I think that shows that my focus has switched to generalization, to principles, and to their validation, and therefore to the whole issue of induction. Particularly, I want to see if I can develop further the ideas I had in lecture um, five, which I've not yet taken all the way, um, and which I'd like to try to work on. Now, our time is up, but I have one question from a couple of periods ago that I want to just, if the questioner will forgive me, knock down. He starts this question, I have grasped that some, for, for some time that experimentation with no explicit hypothesis is invalid. Wrong. It is not true that you need a hypothesis to conduct an experiment. That is a Kantian idea. That we can't go to direct perception to learn things. Only our categories before perception can guide us to conclusions. And therefore, all scientists are warped because they have to come to their experiment with preconception which distorts their viewpoint. Scientists do not come to experiments necessarily with a hypothesis as to what they're going to find. Sometimes they do, in which case that hypothesis had to be based on previous observation. But many times they don't. What they come to it is with is a context, not a hypothesis. They come to it with the idea some kind of connection exists between certain factors. 
That is not yet a hypothesis. That is a, a field to explore. Uh, and the, a perfect example here would be the experiment of Michael Faraday, which I didn't tell you about and I'm not going to explain. But he, he thought there was some connection, some influence of magnetism on light. And he didn't know what the connection would be. So he didn't come to an experiment and say, my hypothesis is that magnetism does X to light. Now I'm going to check it out. He found, after a lot of trial and error, a material that was called lead borate. And he found, after a lot of trial and error, that if you put that lead borate in a magnetic field and run light waves through it in the same direction as the magnetic field, something happens to the light waves. They bend a certain way. It's called polarization. And that was a huge discovery, crucial in all subsequent electromagnetism and in the assimilation of optics to electromagnetism. But he certainly did not come to that, high, to that experiment with the, quote, hypothesis. Magnetism leads to polarization. That is ridiculous. Uh, uh, people find things out by experiment. They don't merely confirm what they guessed in advance. This whole idea that we have to have hypotheses before we can have experiments is a purely Kantian notion that subjective conceptual clusters are what directs our behavior. And the conclusion they draw from it is we can never know anything because all we can do is validate the arbitrary constructs we started off with. So I, I want to correct this question emphatically. It is not true that an experimentation without a hypothesis is invalid. On the contrary, if you're going to make such a rule, it should be experimentation with a hypothesis is invalid. Now, that's an overstatement. But it has to be a hypothesis based on previously known facts. Am I clear on that point? You, you don't think I'm weaseling or middle of the road on that, right? All right, we'll continue in person live tomorrow.